exchange points and the effect, the beneficial effect they have on uh, domestic economies. Uh, we have five people up on the um, panel today. Uh, myself, uh, I'm Bill Woodcock with Packet Clearinghouse. Um, uh, helping with the door here is uh, Sikat Yao, who is uh, with the Singapore Internet Exchange, SGIX. Um, to his right, your left, uh, is Sam Paltridge, who is the uh, communications economist at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, in Paris. Um, to his right, your left, is Garen Ganis, uh, who is uh, with the uh, MAPI, the uh, Internet Users Association of uh, Indonesia, but was also uh, operating one of the internet service providers that was an original participant in the Jakarta Internet Exchange, which was one of the early, really large internet exchanges in, um, uh, in Asia in terms of number of participants. Uh, to his right, your left, is David Satola, who's lead counsel at uh, the World Bank and takes a interest in exchange points and their uh, economic uh, development effects. So uh, we'll get started. Uh, Sam has uh, just a few slides, and um, he's up first. Is that working? Yep. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I thought we'd play a game to start with. Um, I don't know how many of you come from the UK, um, but there's a television show where there's a missing word um, round, and they put up news stories, and then people try and guess the word that's missing. And here I put a headline, um, and I put actually made it easy for you. I put some multiple choices, and the headline is about it's time to break the US grip on the internet, says, guess who? And I've put a few choices there. I've put OECD, I've put ITU, um, Brazil. It could be another choice. It could be um, Iran. I don't know who you might guess. Let me give you the answer. Bill, next slide. Actually, it was OECD back in uh, 1998. Now... We don't get to choose the headlines that people, um, you know, you, you know from your own experience with the media that they don't necessarily choose a headline that you choose yourself. Um, I wouldn't have necessarily chosen this headline. But what this story was about, and the story was actually quite accurate, um, and what we were saying was we need to expand internet infrastructure around the world, outside the U.S., and this was in 1998, and this was after a couple of years of work where we had looked at the benefits of internet exchange points. And we were starting to get inquiries at the OECD from especially uh, traditional telco operators that didn't quite understand the business model of the internet or countries that were starting to say, how can we join the internet? And saying, but, you know, all our traffic goes to the US and this is expensive. You know, what's a solution? And we said, okay. And we looked to the technical community of the internet and said, what's best practice here? And they said, well, create something called an internet exchange point. So we quickly learned about this and our purpose in doing this report was to say to initially OECD governments, but anyone else who cared to read the report, and I know Kenya did quite early on, was to say internet exchange points are just something that's essential. Um, we also wanted to expand things like uh, root servers and at that stage, there was only 13 root servers. And we said, well, that should be, uh, they should be expanded around the world too. Uh, get this infrastructure out there so that's not generating traffic and it's more, it creates a more resilient internet. And I think today there's more than 1,000 uh, internet root servers. Um, could I go to the next slide, Bill? Uh, okay, one more game. One more guess who this was. And this is from an article uh, a few weeks ago, which really made this a similar point about the debate that's going on around Brazil and some of the things the Brazilian government is doing. And I won't keep you in suspense. Go to the next slide. And it was our moderator, Bill Woodcock, who wrote that. Now, again, I don't think Bill necessarily would have chosen this headline. Um, and, in fact, he told me before that he vetoed 
uh, quite a number of the headlines. But, you know, the media does what it does. But if you read Bill's article, it, it was basically saying the same thing consistently that he's been saying for probably 20 years. And that is, internet exchange points um, are just best and good practice. And what Brazil is doing is uh, creating more international infrastructure in and out of the country. They're creating exchange points within the country so they don't have to import um, data. The cost uh, doesn't fall on the internet community there. So could I go to the next slide? Um, so essentially, you know, the main message from my five minutes to ten minutes here is that internet exchange points are essential. Brazil has gone... Bill, I think the numbers are... are they're from your article, so, you know, they've gone from one internet exchange point in 2004 to 23 today, keeping the traffic local, uh, giving internet users better performance, lowering the costs, um, and, you know, it's just good practice. It's what people should do. It's not about balkanising the internet or many of the other things you read um, in the media. It's, it's simply what the whole stakeholder group around the internet ecosystem should be encouraging. Um, but, you know, even in OECD countries, we still have one OECD country, and I think I'm still right, in saying it doesn't have an internet exchange point. And this has implications for um, their economy, I think, and I know they're going to try and address this, but let me just show you a quick couple of examples of why I think this is important in sort of broader economic terms. This is a, a map that we got a company called uh, Pingdom to do because we, we were interested in, a, in where data was being hosted around the world. And so what we said to them was, let's take the country code names. Let's take the top million in Alexa, Alexa and say, okay, where are they hosted? And if it's the blue's darker, you're hosting more of your CC's content, the most popular content. If it's redder, someone else is hosting that and that's expensive for you because every time someone, uh, a local person goes to, to access that content, they've got to bring it all the way from where it's being hosted. Now, I don't know the factors for all these countries. Many of the people in the panel will talk about this and they're much more familiar with these countries than than I am. I know, for example, Yemen is probably not um, a leader in the internet, so maybe they only have one site in the top million and it's hosted locally. But I do know a bit about the OECD countries and there's three that don't um, have uh, more than 50% of their content hosted locally. And those three countries are Mexico, Canada and Greece. So let me talk about Mexico first. Mexico is the only OECD country that doesn't have an internet exchange point. All the content basically gets, uh, it goes across to the States or it goes wherever it goes, but it's not hosted um, locally. Canada, well, only marginally, but just um, over 50% of their content, you know, with their CC is hosted uh, by another country. And of course, it's the US. And again, I think, you know, I read a report that Packet Clearinghouse did about a year, year ago where they advised uh, the Canadian government on how to better structure uh, their internet exchange points so that more people would feel uh, comfortable using the, the, the local data, um, lower cost, better efficiencies and so forth. The other country, and I really don't know the answer to this, is, is Greece. So... Two countries host more content under the Greek CC uh, than the Greeks. They are um, the US and Germany. Now, there's a very good exchange point in Germany, um, so possibly that's a factor. Um, Deutsche Telekom owns the major telco in Greece. Perhaps that's a factor. There could, there could be other factors. But basically, I think this is just one way you can, you can argue that if you create a local internet exchange point, you know, the content will essentially stay uh, local if it can because it wants to. Final example and last slide. Um, the country that I think has been the most successful 
in exploiting communication efficiencies over the last decade in terms of generating uh, industry, jobs, economic growth is in many ways India, directly related to communications. And it's all to do with outsourcing and call centres and, and so forth. And if you reduce the costs of uh, communication traffic, you have a shot at building a services industry around communications infrastructure. This is not directly an internet, although there are some internet aspects to this, but what I'm showing is uh, calls from the United States to India and calls to Africa in terms of minutes. So you can see if you go back a decade, the US made less calls to India than they did to Africa, the whole continent. That's the number of calls in minutes to Africa. What's happened with India? Boom, it's gone off the chart. It's amazing. What's happened to the cost per minute of delivering that traffic? Well, for India, it's gone down like that per minute. For Africa, it's actually increased. So there's a real challenge, not just for these countries, but any countries. If you have a more efficient communications infrastructure, if you have a more efficient market, you will create economic opportunities and internet exchange points are a big part of that. So, Bill, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Uh, we're trying to keep all this relatively brief so that we can have a fairly open discussion at the end. Um, I have just one slide, uh, and I'll sort of speak around this. Um, so, uh, again, we're trying to focus here on the economic uh, aspects of exchange points. And exchange points are really um, analogous to factories. They're the point of production of the value of the Internet, the value of the Internet being the Internet bandwidth service. So exchange points are the point of interconnection between Internet, exchange, uh, internet service providers, and it is that point of interconnection that creates the value that customers are buying. The, va the, um, the work that Internet service providers do is they haul traffic from its origin, which economically is the internet exchange point, to the customer. So if, uh, if we were in ideal circumstances, the customer would be at the internet exchange point and they could just partake of the value directly right there. But users don't want to sit around in the middle of a data center somewhere. They want to be out you know, working in their office or driving in their car or whatever. So the job of the internet service provider is to move the bandwidth from the exchange point to where the user wants to consume it. And, you know, this is analogous to almost any uh, sort of, of consumer good or produce or whatever, right? If you want a banana, you don't want to eat the banana in a, uh, you know, in a plantation. You want to eat the banana in your house. So someone has to move that banana from the plantation to where you want to consume it. Um, so having a local source of internet bandwidth means that you're not importing internet bandwidth as much. So um, if you look country by country, Germany is the country that produces the most internet bandwidth. But Germany also has a fairly large population. It's a very industrialized country, uh, a lot of middle class people who, you know, get on the web at night and read the news, uh, you know, play games, use the internet a lot at work. So Germany also consumes a lot of internet bandwidth. The second largest producer of internet bandwidth is the Netherlands. The Netherlands has a tiny population compared to Germany. So even though each person in the Netherlands is using even more bandwidth than the people in Germany, they don't add up to as much. So the Netherlands is the world's largest net exporter of internet bandwidth. So being a net exporter means that there is inbound revenue to the country for the services that are being sold, the internet bandwidth. By contrast, if you look at countries that don't have internet exchange points, um, Garen later will be able to give an example of, of Afghanistan, prices are very, very high and the suppliers are outside the country, which means we have a net 
import of internet bandwidth and a net export of capital. And that's really not a good thing for a country where capital is already a very scarce thing. So, um, so with that sort of basic overview of exchange points as a uh, source of production, I'll run through a few of, of the other benefits of having them um, local. Speed times distance equals cost in moving bandwidth. Uh, so you can go a long distance at a low speed for a sort of medium cost, or you can go a short distance at a high speed for a medium cost, or you can go a long distance at high speed for very high cost, or you can go a short distance at low speed for very low cost, right? So speed times distance equals cost. If you have an internet exchange point that's very near you, that means that you can either go very, very fast, or you can go very, very inexpensively, or both. So the shorter paths are also less expensive paths. The shorter paths are also faster because everything is uh, constrained by the speed of light. So if you want your web pages to load more quickly, you want them to be hosted on the other side of an internet exchange point that is near you so that the speed of light is not causing a big delay in every transaction and those transactions add up to, to get every page. So um, the shorter, faster paths mean that things are more reliable. Also, there are fewer components in the network between you and the thing you're trying to reach. Each component is a potential source of uh, unreliability. Each component is a potential point of failure. So the fewer points of failure there are between you and whatever you're trying to reach, the more of the time you'll be able to reach it successfully. As I said, with the economic benefits, the main thing is improving the balance of trade. Um, you can think of internet as, you know, any other commodity. You're trying to export more of it than you're importing. You're trying to export more of it than you're consuming. You're trying to sell it at a higher price than you're buying it at. Um, no difference than anything else. Um, and, and obviously it's a, it's a layered thing, right? I mean, the, the actual transport, which is what we talk about with Internet Exchange Points, is a building block. But on top of that, if you have inexpensive access to the Internet, this fac facilitates many other kinds of businesses being layered on top. So um, a test that I often like to use for uh, regulators who are trying to think about whether their regulatory um, uh, rules and schemes are fair or will encourage economic development is to ask, how, how would this affect a high school student? How would this affect a 17-year-old? So you think of many of the big successful content businesses on the Internet. Many of them were started by people who were still students. So if you want those kinds of businesses to be started in your country, you need to think about how your rules and economic environment affect people who are students, whether they have equal access to opportunities as, for instance, your incumbent telco has. Um, if it's easier for your incumbent telco to do something than for a 17-year-old to do something, you're not going to have the kind of innovation that you'd like. Um, and so, so over this building block of cheap Internet access, we can have additional building blocks of content development and content distribution and new protocols being written and new games being developed and, you know, new ways of sharing music and, and film and so forth. Um, that takes us to the social benefits. If it's easy and cheap to move content back and forth between people who are local to each other, and it is relatively expensive and slow to get content from somewhere else, this means that there's a locality quality to the content. That means that content that is near you is cheaper and faster and more reliable and better than content that you have to get from somewhere halfway around the world. That means that unlike compact disks in the hold of a freighter, uh, internet content actually incentivizes uh, this sort of local culture. Um, the, um, you know, I, I, I talk with officials in the Jamaican government, and for Jamaica, one of their biggest exports is music. 
Um, you think of the United States as being this huge uh, exporter of, um, uh, you know, film and music and other kinds of popular culture, but there are other countries that on a sort of relative to the size of their economy, actually do it much more. So Jamaica is one of those countries. Iceland actually has a huge film industry that exports a lot of film. Um, and so for those countries, it's really important to find ways to get bandwidth out so that they can stream these kinds of content that their people are creating at a cost that is not prohibitive, right? Because if they don't have exchange points and they don't have uh, networks building out to them, then they have to take that content and host it and serve it out of another country. And that country then gets all the economic benefit of the sort of production and delivery. Just like, uh, you know, if uh, Jamaica didn't have uh, record producers and uh, distribution labels in Jamaica, the money would all be made by U.S. and British companies that would be doing that function. So, um, then we go on to a very uh, current and topical thing, the privacy benefits. If you have an internet exchange point locally and you want to talk to somebody who is nearby and that traffic goes through your local exchange point, then only your local law enforcement will have access to that information, whatever it is that you're saying. Um, if, on the other hand, you're using exchange points in the U.S. or Germany or the U.K. or Japan, um, then those countries and every intervening country, every country between you and there, uh, is going to have access to whatever it is that you were saying to whoever it is you were talking to. Um, if we go back historically, one of the first countries to really realize how serious an issue that was was Sweden. And so in 2000, the Swedish government had, had PCH go in and um, uh, look at the situation there, which... This was sort of the end of the dot-com era when everybody had more money than time and attention. And the, the one exchange point in Stockholm had gotten kind of screwed up. Um, there were technical problems with it. And so all the ISPs in Sweden were saying, well, we can't afford the time and attention to fix this. We'll just throw a little bit more money at the problem and we'll ship all the traffic down to London and back again. So if you were in Sweden and you were doing business with you know, someone across the street or even in the cubicle next to you, it might well be that that traffic was going all the way down to London and back again. And this was right after the Clinton administration had been found to be doing uh, data collection with the other Five I countries and then sharing it with private industry in the U.S. So they were using national resources to spy on competitors of U.S. companies and give the information about those competitors to the U.S. companies to make the U.S. companies more competitive. And this is something that we know that China does routinely as well. So this is not to single out the U.S. as, as being particularly bad this way. This is just to make the point that this kind of thing happens and it is in the national interest to keep the traffic local uh, if for no other reason than for the privacy of the, the companies operating and the, the individuals in that country. So that's actually all I had uh, prepared. So I will hand it over to David, who can, if you want to use that. Thanks. Morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers of this workshop and also the government of Indonesia for hosting us here today. Uh, my name is David Satola. I'm from the World Bank. I'm in the legal department, um, and I cover globally our investments and our financing of telecommunications and ICT development projects around the world. Um, I want to step back a little bit and talk at a somewhat higher level um, before getting into some of the particular issues on IXPs. We, we look at, we're financing right now um, internet investment and initiatives in about 50 countries currently. Uh, most of those are in the area of infrastructure investment. Most of that is in broadband capacity, whether it's submarine cable connectivity or uh, domestic uh, fiber uh, connectivity. Along with that, we, look, we, we try and have a holistic approach to our projects in countries, uh, looking at the enabling environment, 
uh, and that's the institutional environment, the legal and regulatory environment, um, also the, the human capacity uh, part of it. And so if, if you look at this problem of IXPs from a kind of an ecosystem perspective, I get to uh, one of the issues that Bill raised and one of the questions that Sam implicitly raised. Why are half of the countries in the world without IXPs? Uh, for all the benefits that they can bring um, and for all the, the good that they can bring to a country both in terms of connectivity, uh, economic benefit, et cetera, what is the, what is the problem? Why, why, why are we in this day and age in 2013 facing uh, a, a situation where so few countries, relatively speaking, have IXPs? Um, especially when you consider as Bill pointed out, the, the, the economic benefits of having good internet in a country. We did a study a few years ago looking just at the broadband part of the equation. And this is sort of the headline economic news that came out of it. Uh, for every 10% of broadband penetration in a country, on average, uh, you get about 1.38% economic growth cumulatively. So you know, for 20% broadband increased penetration, you get, you know, just over, you know, almost 3% uh, economic growth. For, for most countries, that is uh, headline news that cannot be ignored. So in that context, if, if, if a country is taking a, a policy initiative to build out in internet infrastructure and bring connectivity into the country, where, where do the IXPs fit into this? Now, we didn't yet talk about the cost of uh, actually establishing an IXP uh, in a country. And our, our experience from the few that we have um, been involved with is that, relatively speaking, the, the cost is pretty low, can be low. Um, we're not talking about huge investment in machinery or equipment. Um, we're not talking about huge investment in personnel or, or institutions. So. To me, there, there's a question there about why more of this isn't occurring. I think part of the answer is a self-reinforcing conundrum. There are, there are problems of scale. There are problems of capacity, both broadband capacity and human capacity. And there are problems of distance. And these are all issues that have been put on the table already. Yet, at the same time, this one little component of the internet ecosystem, the IXP, can overcome those very problems that would prevent internet growth from happening. It can overcome the problem of scale. It can overcome the problem of capacity and can overcome the problem of distance. So uh, with low cost, then I would, I mean, if, if establishing an IXP, the physical infrastructure is relatively low cost, then I'd, I'd look at some of the other issues around it, which are what is the business model for making an IXP work. Um, and then according, ac accordingly, what are sort of the, the governance principles that go around that in terms of how, the, how it's owned, how it's operated, who gets to participate in it, um, at what cost, and, and what are some of the barriers to getting those um, IXPs established. I was in the Solomon Islands last week. Uh, working on a, a submarine cable project there. Uh, currently, the Solomons pulls down all of its capacity from satellite. It's very expensive. Uh, it's prone to disturbance from weather. Uh, the Solomon Islands is known to have a good amount of weather, uh, so there's always a, a, an issue with the, the satellite capacity being brought down. Um, in that context, um, what, what, could an, what could a country like the Solomon Islands and this uh, probably affects countries throughout the Pacific, do uh, in terms of establishing an IXP uh, to overcome some of those issues. Uh, we're, we're dealing in about uh, eight or ten countries in the Pacific, both the South Pacific and the North Pacific, uh, who are confronting these very threshold issues of getting the capacity, the bandwidth into the country to begin with. Um, but then we have these uh, other issues of around the internet ecosystem, uh, for example, internet exchange points. And for countries like the Solomon Islands, uh, 
uh, Pacific Island countries and even um, some countries in Africa where we're working, uh, this problem of always having to go somewhere else for transit is a big issue. Um, in the Solomons, for example, um, assuming that the, the submarine cable were in place, they would first have to buy capacity off of some provider, probably pipe, and then they'd have to buy capacity off of Southern Cross. So within that context, uh, they're already spending a lot just to get basic capacity, basic bandwidth. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in knowing um, in that context the, the cost savings that uh, a country like Solomon Islands could achieve, not only the financial cost, but also in terms of what benefit, what further benefit the internet, that broadband capacity would have in terms of developing local content. Um, each of the Pacific Island countries uh, is, is quite unique. Uh, some of them have very polymorphous social, um, cultural backgrounds. And so local culture, local language is incredibly important. Um, but also in terms of job growth, um, developing local industries, including local content industries. Um, a point that, that Bill didn't make um, when he was talking about the importance of broadcast, uh, or what we used to call the broadcast industry, the content development industry, it's actually um, one of the biggest industries in the world. Um, it, it, it puts telecommunications and internet provision to shame. I mean, content development is big business in a lot of countries. Um, it also is very important for social and economic cohesion in smaller countries. Um, so I would be very interested to hear from uh, some of you in the room who have, who have dealt with these issues. I see Moaz here, Rohan, and, and some others uh, about your experience in uh, both what works and what doesn't work in developing IXPs. Because I, I, I'm actually very curious about this question of, of business models and governance, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively intellectually easy thing to do. Why isn't it happening more? And I think if we could draw lessons from experience, then we in our financing activities in countries around the world could better help um, identify the areas that, um, that could be addressed. Because it's not really a question of financing. Um, no, one, no one's going to come to the World Bank for a $50,000 loan to build out <laughs> IXP infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, we might include it as a, a sub, sub, sub component of a project, but it's not a standalone issue. So in that context, I'd be very interested to hear what some of the real bottlenecks are so that they can be addressed going forward. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, next up is CCAT. He's the uh, Director of Sales and Marketing for the Singapore Internet. Morning. Um, okay. Uh, my name is CK. Uh, I run the Singapore Internet Exchange, the national exchange that was just set up a couple of years ago. Um, I think Bill, Bill and Sam have touched on very much, uh, importantly, the value of what an IXP can bring to an economy. So what I want to try and do now is to add a bit of flavor of uh, what happened in Singapore and uh, how we see going forward and some of the challenges we face so that in the event any you know any of you in the f on the floor wanted to set up an IXP or additional IXPs uh, that is something to also to think about so Singapore is a very small country um, very very few eyeballs uh, and uh, limited land space so back in the 90s uh, when the internet started off uh, everybody was scrambling and like what Bill and Sam has mentioned, everybody buys capacity to the US uh, to the extent that uh, the cost is overbearing and uh, therefore some of the people in the community, the vendors, uh, the universities, uh, a few of us, you know, uh, got together and say, could they actually do something to keep some of the traffic local, especially say traffic between the local ISPs, you know, put it locally so that it doesn't have to go through the uh, very high cost of getting transit, you know, exchange in the U.S. and bring it back to Singapore, even if I have to send an email just to my colleague next door. So the universities and vendors came together and we set up what we had called a Singapore Open Exchange, SOX. 
it, is, it still exists today in the university. Uh, and uh, mainly the purpose was to actually keep local traffic local. So that was back in the 90s. Then uh, in the 2000s, you know, when dot com boom started, people started building data centers, so on and so forth. So you get the, the big giants like Equinix coming to Singapore, and they set up a commercial exchange point. So commercial exchange points have its own benefits, right? Without doubt, and it goes a great way to actually support a typical data center or co-location business. Then in uh, late, uh, in the late uh, 2000s. Uh, Singapore embarked on a project to create a national broadband network where we get fiber to the home and fiber to the offices. So we call it the NGMBN. Um, with the creation of broadband to the home, broadband to the offices, where you can run multiple Gs, like you know 1G, 10Gs, uh, the industry started thinking, hey, with all this capacity, what do we do about you know uh, so many content providers that have set up shop in Singapore, you know, the likes of uh, Microsoft, the Google, the Yahoo, who have set up massive data centers to support the region. So the industry came together with the support of the government, uh, the Infocom Development Authority, and says, let's set up a internet exchange point. Uh, since it is for the benefit of the whole community, we will set it up as a non-profit Right, non-profit, um, and so as the as the story goes, uh, as we get more and more connectivities, the cost of operation should just simply be maintained at a certain level, and the cost of connecting to an exchange point for the members should drop over time. We only need that much amount of money to run an exchange, whether it's 10 members, 50 members, 100 members, the infrastructure is still almost the same. So then the cost to participate in the exchange point actually drops. And that actually brings more value to the members. So that is a big differentiation factor between a commercial exchange and a non-profit exchange. And in fact, today you see that um, the European model of a membership-based approach um, you know, is actually starting to take root also, you know, exporting the idea to US to see whether is that a model that makes sense for the economy. So from a non-profit basis, uh, that's how we started. We started with zero members back in June 2010. Uh, the first member came on board and uh, he was alone for three months with no traffic since he's the only member and there's nobody to exchange traffic with. That is the toughest. Um, just like uh, back in uh, last month, we have finally hit about 40 members. So it's growing slowly and uh, Surely, but we still need the support of each and every one of the members to get the exchange points going. So um, the other thing you notice is, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, Singapore is very small, very few eyeballs. Uh, if you go to the SGIX website under membership, you'll find that more than three quarters of the connectivity actually comes from the region. So the likes of Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Philippines, so on and so forth actually has connectivity into Singapore Internet Exchange. Uh, maybe simply because they are operators themselves, they have submarine capacities, so they have the capacity to go in. But I also actually make it a point when I talk to these members to tell them, uh, you know, keep your local traffic local. Don't exchange your high traffic in Singapore. Please keep it in Thailand. You know, same thing for Indonesia traffic and so on. But if you want to take, say, a, a piece of content that happens to have a major data center in Singapore, then by all means, come in here, pull it, and bring it back. And that is what actually most of them do. So um, we have actually um, online gaming companies in Singapore, uh, situated in Singapore, developing it, and so on. And they actually make use of the exchange to export or to distribute the games in the region. But I actually also tell them the same thing, you know, eventually when your games get popular, make sure you have a presence overseas as well, so they can actually serve the local community better and faster and more efficiently. May not be the most cost effective, but at least the users in those countries can get access to the content much more effectively. Right? So from where we are today, uh, you know, uh, in Singapore, typically you probably are looking at three exchanges. SOX is still in, in existence and they are serving the education uh, education community. So the universities, the polytechnics and the schools. Uh, Equinix being, being the commercial one. 
and of course now there's SGIX. So one of the challenges we face is what do we do in a place like Singapore where it's so small and you have three exchanges running around, right? Uh, one of the things we did was uh, early this year, we actually uh, had a connection up to SOX. So by connecting to SOX, it actually helps the university network. Um, they also don't have to keep investing in infrastructure to, to, to manage and maintain it because their equipment probably is already more than 10 years old, right? So uh, with our support, we hope to actually reach out to the education community to help them, uh, whether it's from the, you know, the middle school to the high school to the colleges, so that uh, the student population actually has access to it. Then uh, the other challenge that we want to look at is now, uh, what do we do as a economic grouping in ASEAN, where we have easily have 10 economies in the region, right? On our own, each and, each, and, each and every one of our economy may be pretty small compared to, say, the US or China or Japan. But if the exchanges in the region could come together, you know, uh, we can build one step. First step, keeping traffic local within each country. And the next step, can we keep traffic within ASEAN? And then after that, do we keep it within Asia? And then how do we actually grow up to connect to other exchanges? Uh, essentially, all this is not about making money and making profits out of it, but it's on actually building a community and building a more resilient internet. And uh, that is where sometimes uh, uh, our, our views with some of the commercial offerings actually differs. Right? I mean, we essentially want to be an exchange point besides delivering the economic value to the economy, also actually to enhance on the resiliency of the network so that uh, a single failure in a single location does not actually results in a catastrophe across the region. Yeah. So that's, that's all I have. Um, more than happy to have feedbacks later on when we have an open discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sikat. Um, next up is Garen Ganis, uh, who was one of the uh, original participants in the Jakarta Internet Exchange, which, which was, uh, I believe, the first exchange in Asia to pass 100 participants, uh, was, although many of them were very small networks. Oh, yeah. About 200 now. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just quickly, uh, because I was kind of summarizing all the discussion, I would agree. Sam and Bill was kind of uh, thinking that uh, with all these benefits mentioning, why is it less than 50%, right, Bill? The adoption of internet actions worldwide. And then perhaps it's about uh, investment so David was kind of mentioning that no money may be not object after 50,000 maybe right because my experience in building internet action in some other countries like $10,000 is enough you know small switch so and then CK was giving kind of uh, the more the benefits uh, on this internet action so what's the problem with this internet action uh, proliferation worldwide so maybe I take a different area. The another component, uh, part of the net exchange, is the uh, building the, um, that I say, the human resource development of, of the uh, internet exchange technology. So I would tend to always uh, split between like what I call layer one and seven issue, which is technical, and there is layer eight and nine issue. So it seems to me economic is not the issue. Uh, I give you two case, quick uh, case studies in Indonesia. Uh, we started 1997 out of hobby. Most ISP back then in 1995 came out from bulletin board systems. So we love modems and when internet hits 1995, 1996, naturally we are technical uh, savvy, would like to go to uh, that area. So we're becoming technical early adopters. So we are the one that actually play around with this PGP protocols, try to do the internet exchange and at that time in Jakarta, it's only about seven, eight, uh, including Indonet, uh, Sanjaya, and the rest. So the government hasn't really stepped in there. So we, the idea was like technical playing around with this. So there has to be an interest, not an economic values first. You start with technical. That's what our experience. Uh, by 1998, of course, there is, we are competing with the uh, incumbents, the big telcos. They are not. The, they're the one has peerings, private peering, but they are not doing this. This uh, voluntary internet action stuff. So that was 1998, and quickly by 2005, it's about 100 
ISP is already joining us. That's just an Indonesian example of uh, maybe we should start not talking about business or the benefit, but just playing with technical areas first. And I repeat the idea in 2000, about three years ago, I was invited uh, by ITU to do implementation design for Afghanistan Kabul Internet Exchange. Same issues. If I, I was there uh, three weeks, and of course the government would kind of help, but ultimately I gather all the ISPs, and guess what? This is not even technical. One ISP said to me, Garen, uh, make sure the internet action filter everything, pornography, everything, okay? And I allow you to do it. Fine, sir. So in the afternoon, I went to another in, uh, ISP and I said, Garen, make sure no filtering. We want all these things because we have military, they need uh, entertainment and internet action provide the same. Said okay, so I have to design the other extreme and the other one, the other extreme, and then by the end of the day, I realized, wow, they don't even know what internet action is, you know. So I do some workshop. Finally, I said, no, sir, the filtering is on your border gateway protocols, not even the internet action. It's just basic a switch. Now and then I realized, doing some more surface, uh, at that time um, there is only one. Uh, let's not not to support vendors, but one Cisco Academy. And only for CCNA, which is the lowest certification. So here we go, we have issues. The currency doesn't even have proper network engineers. I've been pushing these uh, ideas all along that you have to have some technical safety. It's not certification based, but you know, t uh, basically technical people. And then going through the rank of uh, technical issues, you have to understand of course, routing configuration, but along the way, TCP IP, and this is again, was a missing part of the whole uh, skill set in that country. And then finally, BGP, which is, it's not easy to do, that's why there's Philip Smith and the, and the teams here. So basically, I looked, there's two different countries, all underdeveloped countries. So, uh, IT was willing to give anything, money, uh, bill, uh, PCH also would like to give money. At the end of the day, I said uh, 5,000 is enough for starter, which is layer two switching design. It's very simple, but it requires technical safety on those particip participants to do. So we ended up uh, inviting them to Indonesia to, three, to see uh, three operations of interaction, different flavors uh, at that time. So finally, they came to Indonesia, trained for about a week, and then went back and set up the the internet exchange. So I think, uh, again, I'm just contrasting. Uh, it's not just an economic issue. Perhaps the best, the better way to do this is to, to push this as a hobby. By the way, uh, just uh, wave to me, um, anybody who doesn't have any internet action in the countries, in their respective countries right now, in this room? Anybody? That's one from? Okay, that's that's a classic Indonesian. Which country? Lebanon. Lebanon. Okay. Any more internet exchange? Uh, Qatar doesn't have internet exchange. No, actually, not in this class. So, Bill, you have to do a better job next time to invite more the other 50 percent. You know, but I guess I have to stop here because then it's clearly it's about economics. Go ahead. Thank you. So uh, I think at this point we'll switch over to uh, some open discussion and uh, I'll kick it off by addressing a couple of the points that I heard brought up by our speakers. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to uh, let people know that in the audience we have several people who have founded uh, major internet exchanges. Uh, Nick Hilliard uh, in the check shirt there. Uh, He's one of the founders of the Irish Internet Exchange Point. Uh, Moez Jakchuk here, uh, building the Tunisian Internet Exchange Points. Uh, Elena is uh, running the Russian Exchange Points, which are very, very large um, by size. And the guy in the red shirt who has been popping in and out uh, is uh, Pinder Wong, who built the Hong Kong Internet Exchange Point, which was the first exchange in Asia. And also, uh, 
the first academically hosted exchange. It was the first exchange point that was hosted by a university. Um, so uh, a couple of points that I heard, um, both David and Garen touched on the cost of setting up internet exchange points and uh, they mentioned numbers between $5,000 and $50,000 uh, US. Uh, PCH's studies indicate that 90% of exchange points are built uh, for between $8,000 and $40,000 US. So actually five to 50 would cover probably 95% of exchanges. Um, so, you know, there, there have been, you know, people in the ITU who have said $10 million to set up an exchange point. This is, is ridiculous, right? It, you can get a very good exchange point up for uh, well under $10,000. Uh, second uh, point was addressing something that David said about uh, cost savings. And, um, you know, as uh, David and Sam are both uh, economists of sorts, uh, I think this was probably a kind of a shorthand. And it's a shorthand I, I use as well. But in if we were really talking about cost savings, what that would mean would be economic contraction which is not actually what happens and not actually what's interesting, right? So this is a shorthand and it's not a, a literal truth. What we're looking for is not cost savings. We don't want people to spend less on the internet. What we want is for the ratio of what they're spending to what they're getting out of it, the value they're getting out of it to improve. And so by analogy, let's think about cars. Let's say you're in a developing country where it's really, really expensive to get a car in. And, you know, getting a car costs $100,000 for even, you know, a not very good car. And so very few people can afford cars. Cars are expensive. Not very many cars get sold. Uh, we have kind of a medium spend on cars, right, because we have a small number of sales times a very high price. So that's the way the Internet is in a lot of developing countries. We have a very few people using a very small amount of it because it's really expensive. So we're not trying to reduce the amount of money that's spent on the internet because that would be great for those few people. What we're trying to do is bring the price of internet access down so that more people can afford to spend the money to buy it, which means that what we have is a whole lot of people who can suddenly afford to buy a medium priced car. So the amount of money getting spent on cars is suddenly huge compared to what it was before but the social benefit of everybody getting to have a car if they want one is high, right? So uh, maybe the social benefit of everybody having a car is not such a good thing, but, you know, it's an analogy. Um, everyone getting access to the information superhighway, as it was called back when I started this, uh, is a, a really big social benefit. So having the price low enough that many people can afford it is really what we're talking about here. Um, so with that, I'd like to um, see if we have questions or points of discussion or whatever. Um, yeah, sir. Yes, so my name is Bernard Sadaka from Lebanon, ISOC chapter. Um, I, I'm really, really interested in the Internet exchange points, and I really believe in it, and we already have one of the first in the Middle East that was set up in Beirut. But my problem is this. For an, an internet exchange point to be effective, we need local content. So without local content, the internet exchange point is like there just so that we make sure that it's there. Um, but from the point of view of a developing country, uh, for the internet exchange point to be effective from my point of view, is that we need to start to have better bandwidth at the beginning, and then later on, once we have more local content, more content, then we shift the content from outside to the inside, where we actually get the benefit of uh, the internet exchange point. In Lebanon, uh, the government controls the international gateway, so all the ISPs have to pass by the government in order to get content from anywhere in the world. And there's no local content. So the internet exchange point is there, but actually it's not doing anything. Speci specifically when the, I the, the government ISP is not also connected to the IXP. So if I'm to send an email to someone that is using the connection from the government, the, the governmental ISP, 
then I have to go to the internet and come back, come back. So the government is charging me twice what I'm supposed to be sending locally, even though there is an ISP, uh, an IXP, and the government is not is not connected to it. You know, so this is a, a big dilemma, um, and this is one. The second is that th for a good IXP to be efficient, we need really good internet bandwidths. For example, if I want to install in in Beirut, um, let's say a Google Cache, simple Google Cache, Google Cache, as the Palestinian did or whatever country did as well. This will be very, uh, very um, effective and very helpful for the country. So I don't have to go to the internet in, go in order to uh, get the cash. So instead of clicking uh, a, a billion click or like 10,000 clicks per day for one single link, I only have to click it once and I'll get it from the Google cash from my local IXP. I cannot do it because the local bandwidth, the international bandwidth is not good enough. So how can we solve this dilemma? And thank you. Um, I think since I have a slide that I use a lot that touches pretty directly on what you're talking about, I just pulled it up and I'll uh, give a, a quick crack at that and then turn it over to the other panelists. So um, the exchange point is really one portion of an ecosystem. It's the cheapest and easiest and fastest part to get right. So it's often the first part that gets done. but the internet has doubled in size every 10 and a half months for 30 years. And in order to continue that rate of growth, you've got to keep touching each portion of this ecosystem every couple of years and making a tenfold upgrade in the, the performance of it, in the capacity of it. So um, when we got the Beirut IX up and running, the members voted to put it up on a hilltop where they could all reach it by microwave. But the problem is that the microwave kind of tops out, you know, in practical terms, maybe 155 megabits, which is seemed good compared to two megabit circuits at the time, but is not that great compared to the 10 gigs that you can light up on, on your own fiber. And because it's so distant up there, it's difficult to get fiber up to it. And I don't know whether, do you, do you know whether that's happened, whether anybody's actually hauled fiber up there? Yeah. Well, I, I have no specific data about that, okay. but uh, the guys in Beirut IXP are my friends, so I'll ask them. Yeah, <laughs> so last, Bill, last I knew it. Had Bill, yeah. if you remember, the local data lease lines had to be leased from Ojira, who had the monopoly on, uh -huh. on leasing connections, which is why they put the uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Using microwave. So, so part of this is not technical or economical, mm -hmm. it's regulatory. Oh, absolutely. In addition to the monopoly on the international bandwidth, yes. Uh -huh. Right, yeah. so, so yeah. you've got to kind of touch on each of these things and fix each of these problems because each one can be a bottleneck. So you've got a perfectly functional exchange sitting off in a building with high, with, with, microwave links that are very limited capacity to get to it. And the reason it was put there was because that was better than the alternative at the time, which was the Ogero 2 meg circuits, right? Which were very, very expensive. So that was a local loop problem and a regulatory problem. In addition to that, you've got the sort of critical infrastructure problem of these things people really need to get to, which some of them are at the IX and some aren't. You've got uh, the data center issue, right? The IX is up at a building that is used for a lot of sort of business park kinds of things, but is not really a data center. So there's nowhere to go and put a lot of servers if you want to. And it's been, what, like six, six, seven years now, right? So during that time, you should have made it all the way around this loop twice, right? You should have had two tenfold upgrades in each portion of this loop during that time. And I suspect basically what's happened here is the local loop problem hasn't gotten solved and the regulatory problem hasn't gotten solved. And so the other things are relatively minor by comparison because those two are the next bottlenecks that are facing you. Um, so the, the Beirut IX, yeah, it's, it's an example of what can happen with IXs, which is you do everything right in that moment, and then things just kind of plateau. Like it, it, it solves an immediate problem, things get a little bit better, but then the improvement stops because 
people don't go on and fix all of the other problems, right? The IXP is no longer the bottleneck. There are other things that are the bottleneck at that point. So the IX can't solve a regulatory problem. You gotta go and talk with your regulator to solve the regulatory problem. So other people wanna take a crack at answering that? Or no? um, just, just one quick point. You made the point that maybe you don't have enough local content. You need local content to create an IXP. I, I think that's what you kind of said. You have lots of content. We have lots of content, but it's hosted outside. So Right. That, that's the same issue that we have with Mexico, the OECD country I mentioned. You know, Mexico creates an enormous amount of content, but it's all hosted. Um, Mexico creates an enormous amount of content, but it's all hosted across the border. There is no internet exchange point. Um, the government is starting to address that. The president in his reforms said we need an internet exchange point. Um, but it, it just, it's incredulous to me that, that there is no internet exchange point in Mexico. Um, it's just incredible. They host the content across the border um, because it's cheaper, because the, the local uh, ISPs with monopoly power, uh, and it's a single one, basically won't play ball. And that's the regulatory problem. Well, without, <coughs> without commenting on the specifics of the problem raised by the uh, question, uh, I would just underscore uh, the point that was made by the questioner and by, by Bill that there are probably exogenous factors that need to be taken into account in, in why in that certain case, an IXP is there but not functioning the way it should be. Um, I would submit that in that case, it's probably not even a regulatory problem, but that, that it's a political problem. Okay, yeah. any of you from operators in this room? Okay, you guys happen to be incumbent in your own countries? Okay, no, okay. Uh, okay, let me, let me just add on to what, what you have mentioned about Beirut. Uh, Singapore, all right. highly connected and all that. Uh, we always have problems with incumbents. Okay. Uh, I have exchange points. Incumbents are connected, but they refuse to peer. They refuse to exchange traffic locally. That's the problem we have. So um, the point about uh, regulatory governance and all that certainly plays a part. And uh, why does the incumbent refuse to peer at the exchange point with other operators, the smaller ISPs, for example, um, simply because of the fear of loss of revenue, the fear of loss of market share? So they would rather say, you know, uh, charge the content providers a fee to connect to the local eyeballs rather than to peer with them for the benefit of the users. So uh, as and when you get the exchange point up and running, uh, it's always very important to figure out how to actually work with the incumbent get them on board, get them to buy in. So as of today, you know, um, in Singapore, the incumbent is Singtel. So you don't see Singtel peering with other ISPs. You know, they don't peer with the Indonesian members I have. They don't peer with the Thai members I have. They would rather sell them IP transit for revenue, right? And, uh, you know, I always take it that, you know, maybe in the next five years, in the next 10 years, things will change and things will move and they will see it differently. So that's, 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 that's my two cents worth. Uh, Sanjay from APNIC. Um, that has been my observation as well, that um, people of this different size don't want to talk to one another. So if they're on the same size, they want to exchange traffic because they're as strong, you know. Uh, and, and so at the top level, usually they do a bilateral peering. But if you can actually create different tier of internet exchange, right? So you can go down and say, okay, medium level player, you play on this ground. And lower level player, you can play on this ground. I think, and once these different level are connected and create enough traffic, then these three would realize, the three IXP would realize that, oh, <laughs> we almost have the same traffic. It's, it's just that, you know, there's only a few players on the top, uh, you know, slightly more on the middle and a lot of people at, at the lower. And then once the three layers said, ooh, we have the same level of traffic, then they connect. It's almost like you, you guys and uh, socks, you know, in the end said, well, maybe we should 
came through that. So I think uh, part of addressing the problem is to realize that the, the, in the market, and this is a market reality that you cannot uh, pass through, you know. It's a market reality that big people only want to talk to big people. Small people <laughs> talk to small people and use that. Use that to the advantage and create different tier of IXV. Thanks. So on that, um, the, the, the sizes of providers do self-segregate in exactly the way that you're saying. Um, you don't need different internet exchange points to support that. They can do that within the context of a single exchange point and, and generally do. Yeah, yeah, exactly, with the layer two exchange point. Um, what, uh, what we've seen that is kind of surprising actually given the popular wisdom for a long time is that route servers, uh, layer three route servers, uh, are actually becoming um, very prevalent in the number of peering sessions that exist. So uh, a route server is a thing that allows many ISPs to peer with each other with sort of a minimum of configuration, but also a minimum con amount of control. You can't have different policy for different people you're peering with if you're using a route server. So um, the, the popular wisdom for a long time was big, big carriers would say, oh, you know, only little insignificant ISPs use route servers. It's uh, route servers are, are something, you know, us big companies would never touch. You know, our lawyers would never allow us to muddy our feet in such a thing, right? Uh, but in fact, if you look at big route servers in Frankfurt, and uh, there's a huge one in Warsaw now, and a uh, big one uh, in Hong Kong, and a big one uh, in uh, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, these have as many as 100 or 150 participants all peering with each other. So that forms, in essence, a full mesh of peering sessions. Huge, huge number of peering sessions. So that's exactly what Sanjay is saying. A whole lot of little guys all aggregate together, and suddenly the value of that aggregate peering becomes very high. So a big guy will look at that and say, well, I'm not going to admit it to the other big guys, but if I go and connect to that route server, suddenly I'm going to have a lot more traffic to sell to my customers. So route servers actually worked out very, very well in that way. Uh, Pinder has something to say. Uh, Pinder from Hong Kong. I mean, I would sort of going up. I mean, the route server thing is, is a great analogy because, uh, again, what you thought happened and what actually happened, again, things change as your diagram industry. I was just wondering if you, uh, you I've made, I'm sorry, I'm going to be in and out, but you may have mentioned it. What's, do you have any data on sort of, uh, you mentioned layer two? The, uh, in layer three, I mean, how, how does that pan out in practice in terms of exchanges? How many, do you have any data on like, sort of, yeah. um, So PCH actually does, a, uh, operates a directory of internet exchange points, and so we have, we have the, the numbers on that. Essentially, there are no remaining operating uh, exchanges that are layer three only. So there are none that are mandatory layer three. There are uh, a lot of, all Essentially, all exchange points have a layer two switch fabric, but many now have a layer three route server uh, alongside. And uh, uh, Nick, is that something you want to maybe talk a little bit about, how route servers work and so forth? Nick is one of the world's experts in this. Hi, uh, Nick Hilliard from uh, Technical Community and uh, CTO of INEX in Dublin. Um, yeah, route servers uh, uh, offer a way for um, uh, participants of an internet exchange to exchange uh, routing information between each other. Um, there is a certain level of control there. It's not a huge level of control, um, so it tends to be uh, more useful for smaller participants. Um, larger participants at an internet exchange will generally tend to think that, well, they, they prefer to use bilateral uh, interconnection because it suits their purposes uh, a lot better. Um, the There are some scaling issues uh, associated with route servers uh, on really big exchanges. Uh, you can run into problems with them, uh, but they're problems that you can deal with that, uh, if they're managed uh, correctly. Um, certainly at INEX, uh, we found them to be uh, uh, incredibly important from a, from a strategic point of view. And um, we actually monitor our uh, uh, interconnection rates, the, uh, the number of 
uh, bilateral and multilateral uh, hearing sessions uh, at the exchange. And what we've noticed is that the vast majority of the uh, the interconnection at the exchange at this stage is is actually multilateral, which means that it goes over the route service. So this this is a huge boon to uh, to the value of an internet exchange. And any internet exchange out there who isn't using route servers uh, really needs to uh, consider uh, whether they ought to use them in the future because they add so much value. I, w I would like to comment on the cost thing because I heard really good comments from David and you and uh, Garin about it. So I think that uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding uh, related to a type exchange port. This is one of the most thing that uh, I, I think it's a very bur uh, it's a critical barrier. You, you heard my, uh, the message from my, my friend from Lebanon, but uh, it's the same thing was in Tunis. ITI played for real uh, role of internet exchange point without really knowing the value of an exchange point without being uh, in, in, um, uh, in com uh, according to best practices. They didn't, they didn't consider best practices for long years. And uh, the thing that mentioned by Garin about uh, uh, filtering and not filtering, this is what <laughs> my our, our concern for years also in ITI. So the thing that we are today building a new internet, ex very good internet exchange point in terms of best practices and so on, it is for sure we know that it's not a matter of costs. It's very easy. We don't, we, don't, we don't have problem with paying all those switches and uh, we, we, we are familiar with it. We paid a lot, uh, we, we had a lo lot of good infrastructure also in, in, lay in layer three as it was mentioned, but we want to have a neutral internet exchange point. And that's why the, the, the matter of ownership and who spending the money for this internet exchange point is very, very important. Uh, second thing that it is, uh, very important also in my concern, and I was concerned for that for a long time, it is about data center. In our countries, the problem is to how, where to host the internet exchange point. Okay, we want to have an internet exchange point. We, 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 we already, already hosted in data centers, but is it accessible to the other players? Is it open? This is a very good question. In Tunisia, we had this, one of the, of the, of the problems in Tunisia is to have uh, neutral data centers everywhere. Now we have one in FIDA, so we started by building an internet exchange point in FIDA because it is neutral. We promoted it, Bill helped a lot for this. And now we're thinking about Tunis, but the problem of Tunis is that no neutral data centers, only operators, incumbent operators have, have uh, data centers. So a second barrier would be about cost. If you could talk about cost, it would be how to build neutral internet exchange point. And I know that in Sweden, they had an experience to, that government supported that. Is it right? approach to, to make it in uh, developing countries. I know that Sweden is very well organized and today it's a very good switch uh, internet exchange point there. But uh, for developing countries, what, how we can deal with this to promote neutral internet exchange points in order to have very good uh, ex exchange points like in the one and, and solve the problem of, of, of Lebanon, for example. Just a quick comment. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the success of Indonesian internet exchange is pushed by the community. So, do you have any internet uh, community, the internet service providers? Because their function is, is supposed to be as a lobbyist, yeah. active lobbyist, and the government should not be, uh, they should focus on uh, being regulators. Uh, it seems to me in the Lebanon, they mingle with the business as well. But I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, Indonesian, not just incumbent, but the government's kind of confused sometimes. So and th and th this is uh, this is where ABG in Indonesia steps in, and they're very strong in in pushing as a lobbyist. So technically, and then being as a lobbyist, I guess that's the the first venue that we uh, perhaps you should uh, follow actively. Uh, quick comment on that. Yeah. Um, really quickly on Sweden, uh, what Sweden did is something that I think has come over the last now 13 years to be understood by industry to be sort of the preferred and best practice, which is the Swedish government looked at what industry wanted to do and said, that's good, but as a nation, we need a higher level of security and privacy than that. So the government will pay the difference between what you want to do and what we think is the minimum appropriate uh, level of privacy and security for the nation. So um, they wound up with this sort of hybrid public-private thing where the 
ISPs paid what the ISPs would have paid anyway to make these things happen. Uh, so it was sort of set by a market rate. But then the government used tax money to take the exchange points and locate them inside nuclear hardened bomb shelters and uh, put a lot of uh, redundant fiber in and out. Um, so uh, I think uh, Rowan had something that he wanted to say. Thank you. Um, I found, well, obviously, uh, Bill, uh, Bill's presentation uh, actually raises some very interesting, challenging points. Because one reading of it could be that you're basically going to some kind of mercantilist uh, framework, which suggests that, you know, the more you sell and the less you buy, the world will be a better place, which I find quite somewhat disturbing. Uh, and also, I think when you talk about privacy issues uh, or government control issues, um, well, you know, there are some of some people in this room who trust their governments, and uh, there are some people who, whose sort of highest distrust is leveled against their government as against other people's government. So, for example, in my organization, which basically is a regional organization, which works with the, as a virtual organization, my rule has been keep our data anywhere but in this country. <laughs> keep it anywhere. I don't care. <laughs> Preferably two or three places, but don't keep it here. Uh, because this is the only place that they, anybody can arrest me, right? Um, so, you know, I think you need to, to factor these nuances into the conversation. Back in 1998, I was a regulator. I was a telecom regulator. And uh, the ISPs came to me and said, uh, you know, we are having all kinds of difficulties. Uh, I suggested, uh, what about an IX, uh, what about an Internet exchange point? Uh, these, remember, these uh, the days are long past, right? This is when your ISP used to give you an, e an email address. An email was a big deal, right? Not like now, where everybody's email is sitting on some cloud server somewhere, right? Um, and, of course, we had the, the classic problem that, uh, that Singapore, uh, the speaker from Singapore explained, which is a rather... Uh, obstinate and uncooperative incumbent. Uh, but you see, as a regulator, my priority was dealing with voice interconnection, with old-style telephone interconnection. I didn't have the resources to go mess around with data interconnection, which uh, affected a very small number of people. But I did sit with these people, and I encouraged them. I said, you work something out. You'll have our blessings. You'll have our support. But you're not going to get any regulatory action on this, right? And they did. And five years later, I looked at what they did. And I found that, you know, in order to tick a box in any of your tables, there is an internet exchange in Sri Lanka. But in reality, it's like the one in Lebanon. Most of the traffic goes outside because there's too much transaction costs involved in keeping this going, right? And also because much of the... Uh, I think we have to look at this in terms of where is the content that people are using. You look at Alexa or whatever and see people are looking at Google, they are looking at Yahoo, they are looking at uh, YouTube, etc., etc., etc. Where is the local content? In the, in the top 10 or the top 20 or the top 50. If that is the case, how much sense does it, does it make to have this one-size-fits-all solution? And what operators are looking at is a sort of a composite issue, which has peering costs, uh, uh, IP transit costs, a whole series of things that affect their bottom line. Because what I fear is that if this argument goes too far, you might have governments, particularly with the new national internet logic that is gaining ground uh, in the last few months, uh, mandating that I, I that you know you might become very popular that all the governments will mandate that we must have national IXPs preferably controlled by the government, right? So I hope we don't go that route. People should be given the build or buy options. People should have the option of doing things within the country. They should have the option of doing things outside the country. 
Because otherwise what I fear is that some of the needed action for the global connectivity, for the international back, bringing down the cost of Asian back, uh, international backhaul that we are working on. I mean, just to give you give an example, uh, IP transit in, uh, say, Singapore versus Philippines, so I think it's a factor of 10. Uh, it's more costly in, in Philippines. But then you take IP transit in uh, Singapore versus London. Singapore is still very expensive compared to London and so on. These things need to be addressed while we create the conditions for people to, to do their own IXPs. And I hope, you know, whatever we have tried as telecom regulators, we have not really done a good job with ordinary voice interconnection in circuit switch networks throughout the world. I hope, I mean, compared to that, uh, internet interconnection is working pretty well. Be a little careful that you don't push it too hard, that it goes and starts assuming some of the problems that we've experienced with on the voice side. So Rowan made uh, quite a few points there, brought several things up. Um, any of you guys want to uh, touch on any of those? I'll just comment on the, the telecom regulatory um, question that you raised. Um, because about the same time as, as the ISPs were approaching you in Sri Lanka, uh, in my home country, Australia, um, some of the big ISPs were going to the, the regulator and saying, we have one dominant player here who will not peer with us. Um, you should make them because this is just like telecoms interconnection and you make them interconnect with us. And so the regulator looked at us and said, well, yeah, okay. So they chose the next biggest three players. So the four largest players were then uh, peering with each other based on a decision by the telecoms regulator. Now, um, you could look at that in terms of what we knew about telecoms at the time and say, well, we kind of knew this made sense in the telecoms world. Probably it makes sense in the internet world. What happened was, as a result of that, the next largest players were certainly cut out of the market for a long time and it took them a, a huge amount of time to build a competing infrastructure that would have developed if the next three biggest players uh, had basically not had this entree to the biggest player and developed infrastructure and, and learned the lessons and developed competing infrastructure quicker. So it, it probably set back the Australian market by a decade until other players started to develop competitive infrastructure. So that's one of the trade-offs. Um, I think two things that, uh, that you brought up that I, I can touch on briefly. Uh, one is the question of whether uh, stagnating IXPs mean that an IXP was not the right thing uh, there, was not an appropriate solution. I think the exchange point is a necessary precondition, right? It's a building block. And there are a bunch of other necessary preconditions to having a good market. There are a bunch of other building blocks before you get, you know, a complete structure. Um, so I think saying, well, this isn't working perfectly, it's not solving all problems, um, is, is not what's interesting there. I think saying, we got this part done, now we need to turn and look at the other parts and do them equally well is probably uh, what what the appropriate lesson to drive there is. Um, the other the other issue of um, privacy and saying, well, you know, the government of your own country is probably the one that you're most worried about snooping on your traffic. Absolutely, that's true. Um, so the question isn't, is it the government of your own country or the government of another country? It's the question. It, it's whether it's the government of your own country and government of, a, of some unknown set of other countries. So this is exactly the same problem as we have right now uh, with the certificate authority system failure versus Dane. So Dane, the replacement for the certificate authority system, doesn't say nobody can break your certificate. What it says is only your TLD provider and the root can break your certificate. So instead of having a set of 500 random companies around the world, any 
one of which can issue an invalid cert, now there's a specific known set. And it may be, it may be you know, that your CCTLD operator is the one you're most worried about, but at least you know who to look at, right? So it's the same thing with, um, with spying and exchange points, right? That there are very few large exchange points that don't have wiretap access uh, from the national government in which they're operated. But the question is more, do you want your traffic going through that one where you know who's seeing it, or do you want it going through some random set where you have no clue who all is seeing it and how far they're sharing it? Yeah, uh, just one follow-up question since we've got so many IXPs in the room. Um, and, and something else kind of Rohan raised um, about some of the, the content being offshore. Um, I imagine that when you create an IXP, because it's such an essential part of the, the whole ecosystem, that by doing that, eventually you do attract the Googles or the Akamai's to locate facilities there once you get to a certain level. And so that probably is, a, is an important point. I guess we're, we're about at the time now. I think um, if anybody has one more question, uh, we can uh, tackle it. Otherwise, uh, we would uh, call it a, an end to the session. And I think, yes, sir, in the back. Yeah, just one comment on that on the last uh, comment. NZIX in New Zealand, we, we actually found that both Akamai and Google uh, in the early stages said to some of the ISPs if they wanted to install a cache in their network, one of the preconditions of getting that in was to attach it to the exchange because that would that would drive up the required scale. So it does happen. Bender? Yeah. Sorry, uh, if you think, um, Hong Kong Internet Exchange Point at the Chinese University was in the news uh, recently. Obviously, it's known. The question here is in terms of equipment audit. I mean, how do we know, uh, I guess, are there any exchange points that practice um, some degree of security audit for the equipment that gets attached? Um, I think most small exchanges, all the participants wind up seeing all of the equipment because it's all right there in one cabinet. The large exchanges are the ones that tend to be wiretapped. Um, and then you have the sort of weird outliers like uh, the Cambodian exchange, which operated completely illegally for 10 years, right, where because it was against the law and there were uh, government investigators looking for it to try and shut it down, right, yes, they, they did very active uh, auditing of what was connected to it. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, with the Beirut exchange, um, that was an interesting case because one of the big political issues in starting that exchange was um, uh, should only government licensed ISPs be allowed to connect or should both government licensed and Hezbollah um, backed ISPs be allowed to connect. And originally it started out as on only the government ones because they had sort of the majority in the conversation at the beginning and then I think it opened up over time. Um, as people realized that it didn't make sense to have, uh, you know, domestic uh, Lebanese traffic, you know, going over satellite and to Europe and back again over a cable and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think the really big exchanges are the ones that have government wiretap on them, and that's kind of taken for granted. Um, and the little ones everybody sees, and they tend not to be tapped. So, all right, well, I thank everyone very much for attending. It was a good conversation. Um, I think uh, speaking to